Welcome back, everybody, and thanks for joining us for another session of the virtual BH event space. Uh, today, we are joined by our good buddy from Canon here, Mr. Eric Stoner. Eric, thanks for joining us today. Hey, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Our pleasure. And uh, in keeping with a little bit of a theme, we, we talked about some astrophotography previously, and now we're going to be talking a little bit more about the sky. We're talking about photographing the northern lights. Uh, it's going to be a ton of info, so I don't want to take any more of Eric's time. Eric, the floor is yours. Take it away. Awesome. Yeah, thank you, Scott. Appreciate it. So welcome, everybody. Thanks for coming. Uh, I am uh, normally not a fast talker, but I've got about two hours worth of information to get through in, uh, as the title says, less than 60 seconds. So if I start talking really fast, uh, just bear with me, and then I will try to slow down. Uh, let me share my screen here uh, with you guys so you can see what actually is going on. Uh, so yeah, this uh, this is going to be a lot of information in a short amount of time. So I'm not going to dwell on uh, certain pages, and I'll try to zip through some of these as best I can. But um, there's a lot of prep that's involved when you're going to go do uh, something like the Northern Lights. And uh, planning is kind of key for a lot of this stuff. By the way, my name is Eric Stoner from uh, Canon. I'm a technical advisor there uh, in our field education department. Uh, so Let's uh, just, I want to get this quickly out of the way. If for some reason you can't stick around and you want to get in contact with me, there's my Instagrams. Uh, you can go ahead and reach out to me at Eric Stoner Photo. Uh, I'd love to uh, uh, see your stuff. So go ahead and, and follow and I'll follow you back and we can commiserate uh, on the social networks. So uh, as it goes here, I'm going to start by showing you some imagery. Um, now, granted, um, I, I will say that I learned a lot on this trip. I am not by any means the uh, formative expert in the field, but I will tell you what I learned. And hopefully that will cut your learning uh, curve um, quite a bit. So let's just kind of stick with that. So uh, we were there for, I don't know, about eight, 10 days and uh, got some amazing, amazing imagery. Um, and you just never know what's going to happen with the Northern Lights. And one of the best places to go in the United States, as I'll get to in a moment here, is Fairbanks, Alaska. Um, it's it's uh, in that Northern region. And I'll kind of explain what an Aurora is and how they form and that sort of thing. But I want to get to the, the meat and potatoes, which is how to actually photograph it and some of the preparation. So as you're seeing some of these things uh, pop up on your screen, uh, here's just some of the imagery that I did while I was on my trip there. And all kinds of things can happen. It's just like watching clouds, right? So you never know what you're going to see, the shape that the aurora is going to take. Uh, also, I'll say this, the Northern Lights is also known, AKA, right, as the aurora, uh, aurora borealis to be exact. So um, here's some of the, the folks that we had with us on our trip. Uh, a bunch of um, enthusiastic people learning uh, how to photograph these northern lights. And um, there's all kinds of uh, places you can go. And one thing I would absolutely recommend if you ever want to return to one of those areas is use, uh, if your camera doesn't have a GPS feature built in, um, Canon actually makes one that can go and work on your hot shoe of your camera and that will log all the GPS data so that you know exactly how to get back to that location. Because if you end up in a place that you're just driving around and looking for uh, while you're scouting a great place, uh, you may not know exactly where you were when those pictures were taken. So this is a really good tool to have. And I'll go over again, some of that stuff later. Um, but now it's super cold, right? Uh, the, some of the best times of the year to uh, see the Aurora is in March and April. Um, particularly because it's darker, uh, you can see the Aurora is around year round. Uh, it's just the daylight hours are much longer during the summer months. Uh, and, you know, you're not going to, it's there, but you can't see it. So um, you may think, well, Alaska, it's pretty cold, right? Well, this particular um, uh, stream here or, or a little river is a thermal fed spring. So uh, this never freezes. And uh, that's one of the beauties. You can get really cool uh, reflections off of that. And I have some more of that coming up. But uh, this is kind of what, um, you know, Alaska looks like in the central area. Uh, similar to where um, Fairbanks is, uh, it's more flat. It's not like, you know, some of the other regions where they're more mountainous, but um, really beautiful, beautiful country out there. And um, 
lots of evergreens, right? You can use these as part of your composition uh, elements when you're creating your photograph. And, um, you know, one of the cool things about the Aurora is you can see it perfectly, right, with your eyes, but it's more intense when you're actually, uh, you know, doing a longer exposure of, you know, anywhere between six to 10 or 12 seconds, uh, you get that more vibrant kind of look. And we'll cover some of those when we talk about uh, exposure uh, recommendations and things like that. So again, here's some of our crew while we were doing these. And again, it changes. You wait five minutes and things change. Um, that is not the sun, by the way, on the lower left or there. That's the moon. Uh, and I have recommendations on um, different phases of the, of the moon uh, to photograph in. And of course, you know, just like stargazing, it's a lot easier to do when there's no moon. You can see that more, more rich, vibrant, uh, you know, pungence from the stars. Uh, but the um, you, contrary to some people, the way they believe that, you know, you can't photograph in any phase of the, of the moon when the moon is out. Uh, that's not true. Um, and this is proof of that. So uh, we'll talk about different phases of the moon and how it affects color, um, temperature and such. So we'll, we'll go over that. So topics for today, right? We're going to talk about what an Aurora is. We're going to talk about planning. I already mentioned that already. And again, forgive me if I'm talking fast, but I got a lot to cover. We'll talk about cold weather gear. We'll talk about forecasting and some apps that are um, available for you and websites to go to to help forecast uh, the Aurora. Um, gear considerations. Now, I work for Canon. We're going to talk about Canon gear today. It doesn't mean that, you know, whatever gear you have isn't going to work. It's just, it is what it is, right? It's just, it's mainly about exposure, but also about lenses. You need to have the right lens, and we'll talk about that as well. Uh, Exposure and composition. Those are some things, again, I mentioned already. Uh, we'll talk about those. Uh, we'll talk about some time lapse um, and how to create a time lapse in QuickTime. Um, and of course, uh, on our trip, we had the Weather Channel with us. Uh, they, they tagged along for, um, for a, a feature they were doing. And we did some portraits of uh, some of the crew from the Weather Channel. And I will share some of those with you as well. Um, then we'll talk about processing and printing because it's not a photograph until you print it, is it? So uh, we'll talk about that. And then of course, at the end, we'll take questions as well. So let's get into it, shall we? So what is an Aurora? Well, um, basically there are solar storms. There's, uh, you may have heard sunspot, the term sunspots before. Um, these are, um, you know, geomagnetic phenomenon that basically are stirred up by the sun. And when it, it affects, it's affected by, you know, when we see the aurora, um, it happens at the poles, uh, north and south pole, but it's basically charged particles. And they interact with the geo or the uh, Earth's magnetic field. And then those charged particles take on the form of this light that you see. Uh, this is kind of a an example of what a solar storm would look like. Basically, there are little eruptions on the sun that 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 activity ends up taking some time to get to Earth. Uh, so when there's a really strong solar storm, it takes a couple of days to actually have that geomagnetic uh, activity reach the Earth. And we'll, we'll talk about that. So where to see them? Well, here's, a, again, North and South Poles. This is kind of what it looks like. This is an illustration, but uh, this is kind of what it looks like if you could take a not even a bird's eye view, but uh, a view from space. That's kind of what it would look like. Uh, green is the most common color, as you can see from some of the examples I've showed you already. But violet uh, is, is probably the second most popular <laughs> color, if I can use the word popular. Uh, I would say prevalent. Uh, red is uh, a little more rare. You do see it. And I have some where I've seen some red. And then blue, of course, is the most uh, rare of all of them. Uh, but any of them, again, depending on where you are, are, are viewable. It just depends on how much activity there really is. Stronger uh, activity, um, you know, you're going to see more colors. So, of course, you can see this stuff with your naked eye, as I've already mentioned, but um, it is nicer. You get a, a more rich, saturated look when you're photographing it. But it's not, uh, it really depends where you are again. But when you go to the right area and the right time of year, you can absolutely see it. And it is something that I recommend everybody go to see. It is, um, it's one of those bucket list things that I think everybody should have and they should absolutely see what uh, this is all about. So planning is really the key here to uh, getting this right because 
uh, in a lot of cases, you're going to need cold weather gear. Um, so best time to see these again, as I said, um, you know, March, April timeframe, uh, right around the equinox, whether it's the spring or the autumnal, autumnal uh, equinox. But generally, the spring is better because the daylight hours are a little less, especially up in the northern regions of like, um, you know, well, Fairbanks, Yellowknife, Canada, uh, Iceland is another really uh, good place to see it. But again, best place in the United States to see is Fairbanks, in my opinion. Uh, there's some other ones there. Iceland um, is real popular because it falls right within that kind of, and we'll call it the ring of fire, if you will, um, taking that from another um, another thing. But uh, Norway is another great place to see it. But if you want to get there uh, in the uh, continental or the uh, North American uh, way of land, if you want to drive, you can do that. It takes a long time to get there. But uh, the best way to do it is to fair, fly right into Fairbanks and uh, go from there. So here's a portrait of me um, without gloves in um, minus 15 degree weather. I'm not a cold weather guy, but you know I did a lot of research and um, you know, when you have the right gear, everything, uh, kind of comes together. So, uh, don't be the person that didn't plan because if you, even if you are okay with cold weather, uh, this stuff can really bite you because minus 15 is cold, right? But it can get much colder than that. And especially when you have the wind that comes into play, um, it can really ruin your night if you're not prepared. So let's talk about it. Uh, Cold weather gear, layers are best. It's, now, one thing you never want to do is use uh, cotton right next to your skin. You would think, okay, cotton's a good material. Well, uh, let's use that. Well, don't ever put cotton next to you because when you sweat, uh, that will end up um, not wicking the moisture away and then make you colder once that sweat is absorbed into the cotton. So that's number one. Um, moisture wicking like a, a thermal uh, layer underneath is really, really good. Fleece as a mid layer, and then a uh, goose down parka with a hood. Absolutely have a hood. And then uh, insulated snow pants, I think are really good. You could also get those, um, uh, the kind that uh, have a bib, which I, I found because you end up in some pretty deep snow and um, just having snow pants, uh, you know, you could end up falling pretty deep into some snow and, you know, you get cold that way. Uh, if snow gets underneath your jacket. So uh, one of the bibs is really, really good to have. Um, good winter boots is a big thing. If you're, you're, you get cold in your extremities, your fingers, your feet, um, definitely, I think I got a pair of um, white face, the white face or something like that, uh, super uh, insulated. And, um, you know, that's, that would be what, what I would recommend. But whatever you want. Um, balaclava, which is a face, it's a hooded face uh, mask because again, that wind really whips around and exposure to cold. Uh, if you ask one of our Canon explorers of late, Charles Glatzer about uh, frostbite, he's had it on his face. He's up in Antarctica a lot and he's had frostbite on his nose. And of course that's not good for the skin. So um, this is a good protective layer, but what it does allow is uh, air to come through where the nostrils are so that you're not uh, getting that you know, that moisture from your breath uh, onto the balaclava and then that freezes and starts making you cold. So that's a really good thing to do. Mine was made, I think, out of, uh, they make them out of like a neoprene. Uh, so that's really cool. Uh, do that. Uh, if you can, try to avoid wearing eyeglasses. If, if you have contacts, that's great. Use those because uh, you will end up having uh, your breath that ends up on your glasses and then it kind of fogs up and then and can ice over. So that's another big problem you can avoid. Um, so gloves, absolutely. There's going to be several layers of gloves. There's going to be a, a liner, a glove liner, which is kind of a base layer. And then you have, um, you know, try these on at the store, have another layer, uh, well, one layer, which is your base layer, right? And then you put the, the uh, thermal glove over top of that. And it just keeps everything dry. And again, layers is the key to staying warm. Um, but ask, uh, you know, your, your shop uh, what they recommend for super cold temperatures. Uh, don't chintz out on gloves. That's important. And there are some gloves that actually allow you to um, 
pull the, the finger folded over so you can actually get to all the buttons. Um, I didn't get that. I got uh, one that I think they're called lobster claw ones where there are three fingers in a mitten form. And then your, your finger, your pointer finger and your thumb have their own, just like a glove. And I found those to be really, really good. Um, hand and toe warmers. I bought a whole case of these uh, for everybody. And uh, those, I, I always recommend opening up those 30 minutes before you go out uh, or in the car if you're waiting for the Aurora to show up. Uh, oftentimes, if you open them up in those cold temperatures, you'll you'll find that they don't activate as well. Uh, so that's that. Uh, I don't want to spend too much time on that. So forecasting, there are several different ways you can uh, look at this. There's uh, there's solarham.com, which is one of my favorite websites. Now I'm going to qualify this by saying I am not an expert at all this. This is a really like you got a nerd out to really. Uh, get into this. Um, but there's a couple of things that are really important when it comes to forecasting. And one of them is called the KP index, KP index. And I'll share that what that means in a minute. Uh, spaceweatherlive.com is another one. And of course, uh, this one here, what you're looking at is solar ham. Uh, you're seeing these, the, the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere, of course, the Arctic and the Antarctic, the poles. Uh, you're seeing the activity. This is what it would look like if you were to visit the site at any time during the year. Um, and this, this whole thing moves depending on the uh, rotation uh, of the Earth, the axis of the Earth uh, and the season. So over on the right there, uh, these are um, activity that's on the sun that would kind of indicate if there was a solar storm. Uh, and that's helpful when it comes down to forecasting, right? Now, the bottom right there, you're going to see uh, this three-day uh, three geomagnetic forecast. And um, those numbers when, after the, that precede the GO, are the, that's the KP index there. And that KP index is really important. When you see a higher number up into the fives and the sevens and eights, then you've got um, really, really great activity. It could be as low as zero or one. Um, that's where it is a lot of times, but you can pay attention to that. I would recommend if you really want to learn more about this, uh, I'm not the guy to ask, but what I, I know a little bit just to be dangerous, and that's what all I need to know. So uh, moving forward, here's some of the apps, and I use this one here too. It's called My Aurora Forecast, uh, but you can you know go and look at some of the uh, the app store and see what ones uh, work, uh, you know that kind of fancy you're fancy of. So uh, you know figure out which ones you like and go from there. But you see this, this is kind of nice because it gives you the viewing probability. Uh, for that night. Now, one thing I will tell you is auroras are extremely difficult to forecast. So uh, when you're on like solarham.com, those, those forecasts they're giving you are generally a 30 minute forecast. Uh, so when you're out, I would recommend you do your scoping out, your, your scouting early in the day, right during the daylight, so you can figure out what your compositions are going to be. And then when you're at that location waiting, uh, maybe in your car for the aurora to arrive, then uh, you can kind of go on the app if there's cell service there and then try to figure out um, when it's going to come. And we'll talk about that. So uh, these uh, colors are really indicative of um, how the activity is. So green, not so much. Yellow uh, is obviously a moderate. And then red is going to be pretty high uh, probabilities. And then you can see uh, on the right there, you're going to see um, this bar graph with you know, green, yellow, and red. And of course, uh, those are forecasts. They're not accurate. It's just like for forecasting the weather, but I think this is even more difficult um, because uh, of, of the nature of the beast here. So uh, go ahead and check those out. That's pretty cool. So field gear, again, I'm gonna be talking about Canon gear today. Uh, the gear that I used on this trip was uh, a 5D Mark IV as a camera, right? Um, you can certainly use mirrorless. Um, there are um, some potential things you need to be, you know, just be aware of if you're going to use mirrorless for this, but um, nothing, I don't think that's, that's uh, out of reach uh, or unattainable if you have mirrorless gear and want to do this. I'm just going to tell you what I used. Wide angle lenses are the name of the game. So here you want to do wide angle lenses and the fastest lens that you have, meaning low aperture numbers like f2.8, f1.4, f1.8. Um, when you get into the f4 range, um, it's not that they won't work. It's just, your exposures are going to be longer and you're going to be, um, you're going to be missing out. So fast lenses, 2.8 is optimum. Uh, if you can get, um, you know, prime lenses like a, you know, a 14 millimeter F 2.8, that's perfect. If you want to go into like the 24 millimeter 1.4 and get a little bit of a faster lens. So your shutter speeds 
speed up um, even better. But 14 millimeter, I think, and the 16 to 35 were some of my favorite lenses for this activity. There's the 14 millimeter. Again, these are both 2.8 lenses um, and uh, really, really great. So there's the 24 1.4. You don't get as big a coverage or a wide as coverage, um, of course, with a 24. Uh, so you're maybe missing some things because it is all over the sky, you know, from, from, um, you know, horizon to horizon. And there's that GPE two that, that, uh, GPS receiver that I told you about right when I kind of opened up. Uh, and this is a good thing to have on your camera. If you don't, if your camera doesn't have, um, you know, GPS built in, and this is something that, uh, I think it was a good thing to have because it logs. Um, not only where you, you know you are, but it also can log your uh, your journey, which is kind of cool. So uh, tripod with larger legs, this is a must. You cannot handhold, well, you can, it'd be pretty bur blurry, but uh, it, it is a must uh, have in uh, Aurora photography, just like any kind of astrophotography. Uh, so I suggest larger legs because you may be working in deeper snow. And if you have smaller legs on your tripod, they're just gonna, they're gonna sink right down unless you're working on packed snow. And some of the areas that we were on uh, had already been packed down by snowmobiles. So uh, that was already kind of a safe area. But if you go off that just even a little bit, you go right down four or five feet and you're going to need some serious help uh, to get out there. So it's kind of like, um, you know, you never want to, you never want to go uh, swimming at night alone, right? <laughs> so always have a buddy with you so that uh, you can get help if you need it. Uh, and of course, you know, you may say, well, I got a cell phone. Well, uh, some of these areas aren't very well uh, covered by cell data. So um, always have, be safe, just be safe. So the larger legs don't, you know, it gives you more surface area and they don't sink down. Uh, some people I saw had these little, almost like larger uh, pronounced feet that go onto the bottom of their tripod. They're little plates and they're on the little ball so that it, it just has more surface area to sit down so your tripod doesn't sink. And of course, if you want to get into time-lapse uh, photography or you just want a simple, um, you know, electronic cable release, this is a really good option, the uh, TC80M3 cable release, but this also uh, allows you to set up time lapse. So you, in other words, you can ha program it to set, um, you know, take a picture every certain number of seconds uh, for any duration you want, whether it be forever or a certain number of photographs. So uh, that's a really good tool to have. I found just for normal uh, picture taking of the Aurora that my gloves were kind of thick and I couldn't really get to the button very, very well. And I have to take my glove off. Uh, so I use the two second timer to take pictures on, um, you know, every, you know, everyday kind of stuff that I did of the Aurora. I say every day. Well, it's not an every day where you see an Aurora, but you got to get, get the point. So anyway, that's a really good, I, what I would do is I would set the, this unit up for any kind of time lapse that I was doing and then just forget it, let it, let it go. Just don't forget where you put the camera. <laughs> so, and then the last thing, one of the most important things is you're going to need to be able to see, especially if you're working uh, when there's a new moon or no moon. Um, when you have a new moon, uh, it's completely dark and you're going to really need a, a way to find yourself around. But a red um, headlight or some sort of red flashlight is going to be key. You want to be careful about using any kind of a normal flashlight because white light um, will, it'll, uh, it'll blast your eyes out, number one. And number two, it'll take up to 30 minutes for your eyes to adjust back to uh, where they were before you turn that flashlight on. So a red light uh, doesn't affect the rods and cones uh, uh, as much. Uh, and it's easier for your eyes to adjust when you turn on a red light versus a white light. And remember, uh, if you're out there in the winter time, there's probably gonna be snow on the ground. And of course, all that light is bouncing back at you. Uh, so that creates some issues as well. All right, so gear prep, plenty of charged batteries. Remember, we're working in cold weather, so um, you want to store these batteries inside of your, uh, you know, your parka, because if you put them in the pockets on the outside, they're exposed to the uh, colder temperatures and they degradate faster, especially in really, really cold weather. Um, and remove all filters. So take the UV filters, all of that stuff. You don't need a polarizing filter. In fact, a polarizing filter will counteract uh, some of what you're going to see. So you never want to use up any filters, just, just take them off. Uh, you don't need them. Um, now, the, one of the other things is you'll 
absolutely going to want to pre-focus your lens. And I have a, a slide on that that I'll talk to you about the procedure for that. And then you're going to use gaff tape to tape the focus ring so it does not move. Uh, now, on some, uh, some lenses, they have an electronic focus ring. Uh, and no matter how much you turn it in normal operation, it won't move unless you're in, in um, you have it set to uh, adjust. But regardless, it's always a good idea just to tape the focus ring. So it, once you've set it in day, in the daytime, you're not going to need really to change this unless you're focusing on uh, something that's near, uh, in which case then you'll have to uh, adjust later. And we'll cover some of that in a bit. So just be mindful of that. Uh, just simply setting it to the infinity mark. Let me go back here. Uh, there is an infinity mark on the lens. Just setting it to that um, is not always the best practice because it may not really be quite perfect. So follow along and I'll go over the procedure in a minute. Now, the next thing you want to gaff tape is uh, on some of our cameras and others as well, they have a, a light or a red light or some sort of light while the exposure is going on. And you'll see on this camera on the 5D Mark IV, that sits right near the, um, the, the rear dial. And when the exposure is going on, this red light illuminates. Well, that can you know, hit the snow and start spoiling some of um, uh, the other people around you, uh, their picture, uh, and also maybe perhaps yours as well, because it, it bounces around all over the place. And I'll cover some of that as well. I'll show you an example that I have of um, how much light that really creates. Uh, the other thing that's interesting you want to do, you may not think, well, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm out there in a cold, but the, you have to worry about the lens because if you're out there for a duration of time, uh, a longer period of time, your lens could frost over depending on the weather conditions. So get yourself um, some hand warmers and put them on top and bottom of the lens and then, you know, Velcro them onto the lens uh, right before you go out. And this is just keeps the lens warm enough so it doesn't frost over. Uh, it's not a real big, big deal, um, but it's what you don't want to happen is spend all night taking pictures and then realize, oh man, nothing came out because my lens frosted over. So, and then also uh, buy a dry sack. These are sacks uh, the, uh, that just keep moisture out um, and you could keep it, your, your camera in this while you're not out there photographing, maybe you're in your car warming up or whatever, uh, and keep it in there so it's outside and away from the elements. Uh, one thing that's really, really important to consider is um, you don't want to bring a cold camera in a warm car, because if you do, this can happen. Moisture will, you know, start coming in and, and forming on the outside of the camera, and then basically your night is done. Uh, if you've ever gone into an indoor pool in the wintertime uh, with glasses on, you know what I'm talking about. Um, it's going to take a long time for the camera to adjust. So condensation can be a big enemy. Just leave your camera outside of the car um, when you have those situations. All right. Uh, again, more gear prep. Um, shoot in raw. Uh, this is one of the, the big things. More information is better. Even if you're not real familiar with uh, how to process a RAW, it would be better for you to shoot in RAW, maybe shoot in RAW plus JPEG if you are if you need that comfort level. Uh, at least you'll have something you can share right away and then process the RAW files later. But the RAW data has all the information, including, um, you know, everything from color space, from RGB, uh, Adobe RGB to sRGB, and I'll cover that in a minute. Um, and those are important things. So speaking of uh, Adobe RGB, this is, again, if you're shooting RAW, it doesn't really matter as much. You could be in sRGB, but Adobe RGB is a broader uh, color space. And you're going to, because you're working with subtle colors, it's a better idea to capture more colors than less. The end result here uh, really depends on if you're going to print your photographs, what the machine is that's set up that's printing your photographs. Some machines are set up for sRGB. Some machines like um, I have a, you know, our Canon wide format printers are set for Adobe RGB. So you want to generally print in that color space that your machine is going to be set for. But it's not the end of the day if you have an sRGB uh, color space and you print on an Adobe RGB color space printer. You're just not going to get the benefit of all the extra colors that it has. So uh, know your gear. This is a big, big thing. It's just like when you drive a car, you know where all the, after a while, you know where all the buttons and dials are and you don't have to go looking for them. So you end up 
you know, getting in an accident. It's important as, because the Aurora changes constantly. And if you uh, don't know where the buttons and dials are on your camera, you're going to be searching for them and turning your light on and off to find them. And this can, you know, meanwhile, all this stuff's happening off in front of you and you could be losing beautiful shots that can happen. Uh, so just know where everything is on your camera. Okay, now focusing, this is critical because I had a friend of mine uh, go out and photograph when the, when the Aurora dipped down into the uh, Dakotas a year or two ago, might've been two years ago now. Um, my friend went out and she set her camera to infinity and ended up with pictures that weren't crisp and sharp. So this is what we want to do. We want to put your camera, uh, your lens into manual focus. That's the switch AF, MF. You want to be in manual focus. Um, the other thing is um, focus through the daytime. And I have, again, a procedure I want to show you how to do this in a moment to get really, really good results. And then you're going to tape the lens with gaff tape. Don't use like electrical tape or you know scotch tape, something like that. Use gaff tape because it doesn't um, put any residue on your lens once you take it off. The next thing, again, use if, you, if you're going to use live view, um, lower the screen brightness. Of course, even you should do this anyway, because when the, if you have image review set to like two seconds, which is how their camera comes out of the box, every time that image comes back up, it's going to blast light in your face and it's going to be difficult for your eyes to adjust. So take the, um, the screen brightness uh, adjustment all the way down to its lowest setting. So it's less uh, and, you know, it's not affecting your eyes as much, but if you're going to use live view for focusing, say you're going to focus on something that's in the foreground and you want, you don't want that to be out of focus because you've just pre-focused on during the day on the furthest thing the camera could see. Um, you may want to use live view to focus and then have your light on that subject. So you can kind of dial in your focus there, but again, turn that that density or the brightness of the screen down. So uh, you, your eyes can adjust much better. Um, use the red flashlight, as I mentioned, or a headlamp, uh, which is great because you just put it on your head. It's right here and you just flip the button and you're good to go. You don't have to worry about carrying around a flashlight with a red filter on it or dropping it or whatever. Uh, it's just the more hands you have, the better to uh, work on the, the, the task at hand, which is photographing the Aurora. Um, Again, talking about focusing on something in the foreground, you can bracket focus. So I have an example I'll show you where I photographed this Peterbilt truck that was parked in this parking lot. Um, but if I'm focused on the, you know, on the Aurora, that's going to be out of focus, the, uh, the, the, the truck. So you have to you know, worry about that. So basically, I had somebody go up and shine a, the red light on the actual front of the truck, focused on that in live view. And then I did another shot where... Um, I focus on the background and then I just merge them in photograph uh, in, in uh, Photoshop later. Uh, some don'ts, don't use autofocus, okay? Because the, the points here, A, the Aurora is, is moving constantly and it's not doesn't have any sharp contrasty edges generally. Uh, so autofocus is gonna just search. So always, always, always manual focus. Um, don't, again, as I said, don't use the infinity mark on your lens as a means to think you are in focus because you may not be. Um, don't use a white flashlight. We talked about this. Uh, again, your eyes will take 30 minutes to uh, up to 30 minutes to adjust. Now, uh, daytime pre-focusing procedures. And I, we're going to get to some imagery here in a minute. I know, but this is all important. We want to get to some of this really important stuff uh, before too long. So, uh, set your camera on a tripod, turn the lens to manual focus, aim as far, you know, as far away, if you're, you know, at a hotel or whatever, aim it as far away as you can see, or um, on a street sign or something like that, that has some text on it that you can see, and then turn live view on and push the magnify button a few times until you get like 10 or 15 times magnification. And then you basically, what I think I recommend you doing is get like a, a loop uh, whether it be like a Hoodman loop or something like that, that you can put on the screen and then really dial in the manual focus uh, to your liking uh, until things are super sharp. And then once that is done, gaff tape that sucker shut so that uh, it will not move and um, you are set to go. You don't need to change anything for the whole night unless, again, I said, as of course, if you're going to photograph something uh, in the foreground, then you may need to change it, but uh, otherwise you'll be just fine. Uh, so then, uh, again, switch 
the lens to manual focus. If you want to, this is just for live view focusing, or if you have a mirrorless camera uh, and you, you know, you don't have an optical viewfinder, um, this is a really good way to uh, focus in the field, so to speak. So you're going to turn the, either live view on, or you're just going to look through the viewfinder or the LCD screen. Uh, it's going to be a little difficult at night in real dark situations to see what you're seeing on the back of this example here you're seeing it's not quite that bright so if you have the moon that's a really good source to uh, to focus on and then just again turn the um the live view on to magnifying uh, the magnifying like 10 times and then again same procedure manually focus until things look nice and sharp to a pinpoint and you're good to go uh, here's an example of what that might look like as you're changing whoops, as you're changing your focus um, this is kind of an animated thing. So it gets from blurry and then goes to uh, sharp pinpoints of light. And when you get that, you're in pretty good shape. Optimally, the best thing to do is to do it during the day so that you have more control. All right. Exposure recommendations. Um, auroras can change in their brightness and how intense they are, right? So it, it, this is general terms here. In general, set your ISO from 1600 to 12,800. Obviously, if it's dim, um, go higher on the ISO. If things are, the lights are dancing around, when you see, when I say the lights are dancing, you're going to know because you're going to see it. If you've never seen it before, they start moving. Um, they can start moving pretty quickly. Uh, and you, you want to sometimes freeze that action, so to speak, even though you may be at, you know, a second or two long. Um, in typical terms for photography, that's an eternity. That's not really freezing the action. But in this, it would be considered kind of freezing the action. Um, widest aperture possible, right? F2.8 or wider. Uh, so 2.8, 1.8, 1.4, you know, that kind of area. Shutter speeds between two and 10 seconds. Uh, this is not a hard and fast rule. If you need to go longer and you have an F4 lens or something like that, go ahead. Um, but this is general terms. So you're going to have to kind of, you know, compare and contrast uh, your results and then just make your adjustments from there as needed. So when those lights start dancing, as I mentioned, you want to raise that ISO up so your shutter speeds shorten, and then you'll get um, a really, really interesting look, which can look like this. Um, you start getting that real like radiating, radiating uh, look from the sky, from the aurora. And when this happens, if you have a longer exposure, it's going to look like um, like a waterfall in slower exposures, right? It's going to be like creamy and milky. You're not going to get those real pinpoint radiating lights from single point. So that's really important uh, if you want to freeze that action, so to speak. So again, um, lots of different ways to um, skin a cat, if I may use that expression. Um, but OK, so again, let's, let's kind of go here. Um, you generally want to keep your exposures less than 30 seconds because any more than 30 seconds, you're going to start getting streaks from the stars and that can, uh, that can kind of ruin the picture if that's what you're going for. Shorter exposures are better. Uh, don't use long exposure noise reduction. What that will do, let's just say we took a, a 10 second exposure. Uh, the camera will then close the uh, exposure down, but it, it's still exposing a blank frame for another 10 seconds. So every time you take a picture, on a 10 second exposure, it's gonna double it to 20 seconds. So you're wasting time. Um, don't use that for this particular kind of photography. Turn image stabilization off. You're, uh, you, there's no need, you're on a tripod, uh, unless it's super windy um, and it's blowing your camera around, I, I would recommend just turning it off because uh, if you're in a really windy condition, it's always a good idea to get a, cam a tripod that has a little hook on the bottom of it. You can take your bag and hang it uh, and really weight the tripod down just to help keep things stable. Uh, and as I mentioned before, always shoot in RAW if you can, or RAW plus JPEG. And then just uh, another thing that's really important is to keep an eye on the RGB histogram, not the uh, brightness histogram, which is just that single graph. Um, I just did incidentally um, on Canon's YouTube channel, a, um, a video on histogram. So maybe you wanna go check that out. Uh, but the RGB histogram looks like this, where you're seeing both histograms uh, the brightness and, of course, the RGB, which is the one on the top there, where you're seeing the individual histogram for each channel. You want to pay particular attention to the green channel. And you'll notice on this particular image here that um, it looks like in the bottom central part of the frame, the aurora is getting a little blown out. And we can kind of tell that by looking at the right side of the histogram. You see a little spike all the way on the right side uh, of the green uh, channel uh, right in here. 
that is giving me a potential exposure overexposure warning that I'm blowing out detail in that green histogram. So you want to adjust the exposure down uh, or shorten your, your shutter speed to account for that. And then uh, on this image here, you can see all the data is confined within the, uh, the graph there. So it's, we have printable detail there. So that's important. It's a different shot, but, and of course this one is, was taken in vertical composition. So you kind of have to turn your head to see what it is. Forgive me for that. But uh, the really important data here is uh, the green channel on the RGB histogram. So in that case, we're in good shape. So you just want to monitor that because uh, one thing you don't want is to have your exposures uh, blown out and then, you know, it's maybe a once in a lifetime thing. So getting yourself ready, all right? So wait in a warm car. And if you're in uh, Fairbanks, you want to face the Northeast or Northwest sky. Have your tripod ready to go. Have your, you know, camera in hand in the, cam in the car. Uh, before you go out. So you can go from warm environment to cold. You just can't go from cold to warm. So if you, you know, you're going out to your location for the first time, um, warm to cold is fine. So keep the camera in your lap. And then eventually, uh, you know, every, every once in a while, point your camera, roll the window down, point the camera in the direction of the Northeast or the Northwest. And you don't even have to have it on a tripod, just take an exposure. And um, you want to see if the aurora is actually on the horizon coming. You may not see it with the naked eye, but it may be there and it might look like this. So if it starts looking like this, get out of the car and get ready. Get all your gear on your tripod and get to your location because things are about to go down. Uh, so you want to go because it is go time and then uh, hop to it, buddy, because it, it could last a, a little while, it could last all night. You just don't know. Um, so there are, again, now we have images, right? We're, we've gone through all this technical stuff and now we finally get to see some imagery. Uh, it's, it's just the coolest thing in the world if you've never seen it. Uh, it's, it's kind of life altering, I think. Again, as I mentioned, everybody should go at least have this on your bucket list to do one time in your life. Uh, and you know, yeah, it's cold weather. You're going to have to deal with it if you want to see this really pretty stuff. That's what all I can say. But it, look, I mean, it's just different. Every, every, everywhere you turn is something different and it just takes on different forms. And what was interesting about this particular photograph, you may see in the very bottom middle of the frame, there's this green uh, line, straight line coming out. And originally I thought that was some kind of a scratch or something. Uh, turns out it was a, uh, a telescope and that laser on the telescope helps direct the, uh, the, the telescope to whatever they wanna focus on. So uh, that was kind of cool. Uh, anyway, you're seeing uh, the purples uh, and the, a little bit of magenta in, um, in this particular one. So that's kind of cool. You see different colors, uh, different shapes and forms, all kinds of different things that you can do. Now, let's talk about localized light pollution. I mentioned that red light on the back of the camera, right? So from your camera, as you can see, somebody didn't tape the back of their camera up and you can see all that red light on the bottom of the, uh, on the floor there on the, on the ground where um, you see this, you know, light pollution happening. And um, that can, if somebody's behind you, that can flare out your lens, believe it or not, and ruin their photographs. And, and with all this snow around, it can also uh, impede into your photograph because all that light's bouncing around. So be careful about that. Uh, now, some other um, things that you want to be careful of if you're in an area where other people are going to enjoy this, and they will because it's the Aurora, people are going to come by. If they are sitting in their car with their lights on, or maybe even just their tail lights um, or parking lights, that this, what you're seeing here, that big bright red light is just from the parking light at about 10 seconds long. It's going to add, it's going to look like the sun coming out there. So if at all possible, uh, either shoot in a different direction or, or ask them to turn their lights off uh, or what have you, because it could potentially ruin your photographs like this here. Okay. Now, some other things, uh, this is that, that Peterbilt uh, truck that I mentioned to you. Um, this was light pollution coming from, again, just simple tail lights. Aren't that bright, but they look awful. And um, that's what it would look like and ruin your photograph. So that's 
uh, that. Now, this is how it's actually supposed to look. After I told them to turn the lights off, that's um, what the picture should have looked like. Is it a great picture? I don't know. But I just wanted to add something kind of interesting in the foreground. And that's what I uh, had in front of me. So that's what I took. And again, this is one of those situations where I had to focus, um, had somebody hold a light on the, the front grill of the truck so I could see uh, and focus on that and then go uh, from there. And of course, city light pollution. Uh, there's not going to be much of that out in Alaska, but this on the horizon here, uh, for those of you that live in New York, you know about this, right? Um, but the sky will glow. And this is actually Fairbanks about 25 miles away. Uh, and that can you know, add some interest to the picture or it can uh, ruin it. And again, depending on uh, the angle in which you are facing, um, you just have to be mindful of that. And you may not always see it as much with your naked eye, but when you see it in a picture at a longer exposure, it's, it's actually going to happen. Again, he, this is a portrait I was doing with a buddy of mine uh, on the trip. And that lower left is Fairbanks. And Fairbanks isn't that big. But so you can imagine, um, you know, when you're out there in that kind of condition where everything's usually really, really dark, uh, even a small city can really um, make things uh, lit up. So that's city light pollution. Let's talk about composition, shall we? Um, you know, this is a, a very subjective thing um, and it's gonna be very much depend on, you know, what's in front of you. Um, I always like having some sort of element to ground the, um, the picture. And in this case, the evergreens down here do a fine job of grounding uh, the image to add a base to the image. And then of course, Again, this stuff changes constantly. They don't move at you know lightning fast speed, but it's slow enough where you can actually move around and change your exposure so you can see, uh, or change your composition so you can see what's going on and then maybe add something interesting in the foreground. Uh, again, here's that thermal fed spring. Uh, I wanted to get uh, some reflections off of the water. Uh, generally speaking, reflections of water are about one stop darker than the actual, uh, what they're reflecting. Uh, so that's why you're seeing that darker uh, reflection in the uh, in the water. And then, of course, this one's kind of cool. Um, same scene. This is that packed uh, from snowmobiles. You can see on the left side, that's uh, packed snow. As soon as you go off to the right side there, uh, you sink down about three or four feet. So you, again, just have to be very careful. But um, it gets really pretty. And then all kinds of things can appear. Uh, you know, when you look at clouds, you see things. And of course, I see some sort of like alien uh, uh, you know, in this particular picture here. And then uh, over here, it got even better. Uh, I see like a skull or something with some sort of like a superhero cape or something. I mean, you know, you could, your mind could wander and think of whatever, uh, but it's just kind of cool, the stuff that can happen right in front of your eyes. And just, it just does this stuff. So you got to be ready uh, and not fuss fussing around with the buttons on your camera other than the exposure button. Uh, that's all you really need. And of course, um, there's a thing called the corona, and that's where these uh, radiating lines and lights come from a single point. This, take your pictures of this, and then I, uh, I recommend you, uh, when you're done taking pictures of it, it don't, doesn't last long, lay down on your back and just look straight up at it, and it, your mind will be blown at how beautiful it is. Um, what's interesting about this is I think it's far greater experienced live than it is in a picture. Um, and of course, there's no, speaking of composition, there's nothing really holding the composition down here straight up at the sky. So there's not a lot of interest there, but it's really, really cool to see live. Um, so let's talk about color temperature next. How do we set that? Now, of course, if you're, if you're shooting raw, you can change all of this stuff later, but let's kind of get it as best we can in the camera to start. So we're gonna talk about this in, um, in terms of phases of the moon. So when you have a new moon or no moon, um, the best color temperature to use is 3,500 Kelvin. If you don't have a uh, um, color temperature uh, dial where you can dial in specific color temperature numbers on your camera, don't worry about it. Um, you can go ahead and shoot in tungsten, which is the light bulb. You can shoot in fluorescent, which is uh, very close to about 4,000 Kelvin. But anyway, you can see here on the screen, uh, the more moon that you have, the, the, the higher temperature you should bring the, uh, the color temperature, the Kelvin temperature, because remember, the moon is reflecting what? It's reflecting sunlight, so that's daylight balance. So we get uh, up to full moon, which is gonna be a little more difficult to focus, uh, to 
to capture the aurora, but now you're, of course, daylight is 5,600 Kelvin or around there. Um, so the more moon we get, um, the higher or closer to daylight temperature we should get. General recommendations. Uh, and of course, there's always reasons to break those rules for creative purposes. Okay, and so time lapse. I'm going to show this. I have a little movie here to show you. Uh, it's. It, I didn't think I put this in here, but I did anyway. Um, it's just a time lapse. Hopefully, it'll come through on your end. Uh, again, this was done over time. Um, set your exposures every to go off every five to ten seconds, uh, and then um, just set the camera and let it go. And of course, some of these cameras have this feature built into it. Some you would need the TC eighty N three intervalometer, and then you can merge these together later in uh, in the QuickTime movie function. And here's, here's what it looks like over time. Now, these weren't really, this was just processed right out of camera. Nothing special was done to these. Um, but just so you can get an idea of what this looks like. And you can see the moon there. Uh, the, everything's kind of, you know, moving in a diagonal direction as the, the rotation of the Earth is causing, you know, the, the star trails. Uh, if you were to take long exposures, that's, that's what would happen. But anyway, kind of a cool thing. Uh, that's just a quick little example of what um, a time lapse would look like. These obviously you want to have a separate camera for uh, just dedicated for time lapse because it it can take obviously uh, you know sometimes hours to get a decent amount of footage uh, to run together. So the other thing I want to talk about was doing some portraits under this guy. I'm I'm kind of a portrait photographer. I'm not kind of I am. Um, and this was Katie Lindendahl from she's a tech reporter for the Weather Channel and she had her crew come with us and we spent some time and we wanted to do a portrait of her. Uh, while we were out there. And, and uh, so there are a lot of different ways to do this. And the way I did it was just, it worked for me, but they, uh, the practice makes perfect kind of. Uh, it's a, it's gonna depend very much on conditions, right? So we had about a half moon for this, which was kind of nice. It was coming from behind me and to my right, uh, from behind my right shoulder, which was illuminating her great. You can see the shadow behind her, um, but it was, it was high enough in the sky that it wasn't really giving me a great uh, enough uh, light on her face. So I tried flash. And of course, at the time I had a 600 EXRT, which the, lo the lowest that will go is 1 1 28th power. And at, at 6,400 ISO, poof, it blasted her. Uh, now with the Canon EL1 flash, which goes six stops less than that, uh, I probably could have done it. But what I ended up using was in this case, I used a flashlight, an LED flashlight, and I just bounced it off of the snow out of camera view. And that allowed me to get enough light back on her face to, um, to make it work. So uh, again, trial and error. I just went through that verbally, but you can see here um, how things kind of went. But the end result was a pretty successful portrait. Now, remember, these are longer exposures. So you have to tell your subject, they got to hold super, super still uh, for about six seconds. So it's a lot of trial and error and checking, um, you know, the exposures to see afterwards to see if the, you know, the subject is moving around. Uh, anyway, viewfinder, you could use your viewfinder as an illumination factor. Um, I always take a picture of a, a gray card uh, and then use that as your illumination. Otherwise, if you're taking a picture of uh, the Aurora, that green light from the Aurora is going to shine that green light on their face and you're going to end up with green faces. So gray card is nice because it's a, not pure white and blast them, but it'll give you enough exposure on them to make it work. Uh, so just trial and error on that stuff. But the, the real goal obviously is getting great pictures. And speaking of getting great pictures, remember I said, it's not a picture until it's printed. And this is my uh, little bit older printer. This is the IPF 80, 8400 uh, 44 inch printer. And um, I, I love printing. And this is one of my favorite things to do because you can, you can print stuff to the appropriate size for which it is designed. And uh, I love hanging those things on um, not necessarily uh, my walls. I put my family on my walls, but a lot of people that really enjoy this stuff, I'll make a nice print for them and they can hang it in their home if they really enjoy that. But you have to start by profiling your monitor. You have to work in a, in a, color neutral environment. And this is critical for a lot of reasons. And um, get yourself a good color perimeter. There's lots of them out there that will help neutralize any color shifts that you have in your monitor. Um, process these in 16-bit TIFF, not 8-bit. JPEGs are 8-bit. 16-bit gives you a broader uh, tone range. 
Uh, and um, you know, you're getting half of that from an eight from a eight bit JPEG. Uh, use ICC profiles from the color manufacturer. And if you've never seen what a color profile looks like, this is kind of what they look like, but you insert these into the proper folder. Uh, it's easy on a PC, you just right click on these and then hit install profile and it puts it in the right place. Um, on Mac, it's a little bit more of a process, but it's not that big a deal. Um, and then occasionally something interesting happens where you get a proposal that happens. This was one of our former employees uh, that got proposed to her uh, fiance, now husband, uh, proposed to her under the Aurora, and we were all on, on onto this and took pictures of it, which was kind of nice. And there's the happy couple there. Uh, and beyond that, um, you know, we got some great pictures of everything in the Aurora that we could for a very short period of time that we were there. And then once in a while, something really, really interesting happens, and you get something that happens like this. This heart appeared, and it was only there for about 30 seconds, and then it morphed into something else. But how appropriate where we were able to um, uh, give these guys a print of this and their picture as they were engaged under the Aurora. So that is my program. Uh, again, for those of you that didn't maybe get that in the beginning, here's my contact information. If you need to get in touch with me for any reason, it's at Eric Stoner photo uh, on Instagram. And then uh, that was a whole mouthful uh, for the last hour. I hope I didn't bore you. And I hope you actually learned something because there's a lot of detail there. And I'm pretty sure this is going to be up on the BH YouTube channel. So you can go back and, and review it again at some point. I'm not sure when that's going to be up there. But um, Scott, uh, what um, what do we have? I'm going to unshare my screen here. Sure. sure. Uh, so what do we have questions wise. So here's here's the absolutely unbelievably amazing thing is that 95% of the questions that came in, I think you've answered already. <laughs> Because, then I did a good job <laughs> because you did such a thorough job. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, it, was, it was it was an incredible presentation filled with a ton of information, and uh, I mean, you know, I, I'm I'm okay with it. I was very comfortable with it being from being from New York. You know, the the the, the speech was 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 perfect. It was fine. I was able to understand yeah. everything. Good. I'm I'm glad. I, I tried. Um, you know, I like I said, this presentation was originally two hours long, so. Uh, I, I cut some stuff out, but I wanted to keep my uh, my East Coast uh, cadence pretty good. <laughs> so it's it's good practice in case you're falling out of it. It's it's absolutely, absolutely. amazing. You yeah. haven't you haven't missed a beat. <laughs> yeah. So thank you. So were there you, there were uh, maybe five percent of the questions that that we didn't get to? What do you have yeah. any of those? Yeah. Um, uh, so so Tom wanted to know if it, well I think he kind of addressed this early on, but he was asking if they're always green. Have you, have you captured, I know you mentioned about some of the other colors. Well, green, yeah, green is the most um, common color. Um, and then followed by the violet um, color that comes in and then um, red is a little more rare, uh, but it does happen more often uh, than, than of course blue, which I did not see when I was there. Um, that's like the rarest of the rare. Yeah, and, so. and I mean, it may, this might be out of your scope of expertise, but is, is, do you know the reason why that is? I, I do not. Uh, no. Yeah, there. Uh, my my extent of the knowledge of, you know, what and how about the Aurora, um, it, it, you could fit into a thimble. Um, <laughs> but I know I know enough that like I know I walk into a room, I hit the light switch, and and the lights come on. And it goes on. <laughs> I I don't need to know the whole process, um, but if you really want to geek out and learn more about it, there's so much out there um, that, you know, even just on YouTube that I'm sure if you, you know, especially when you get into like the, um, you know, the sites and the, and the apps uh, that are out there, there's tons of, especially solarham.com. You, you can learn a ton about this stuff. And I just, it, that kind of stuff just doesn't excite me about learning all of the real nitty gritty I just need to know enough about forecasting so that, I, okay, is it going to come or is it not going to come or how strong is it? Right. That's, that's what I want to know. And of course, the best thing to do is if you look up in the sky and you see it, then you know it's here and you just start working. So if your head's in your phone, you know, all the time, you're missing it's stuff. Gone. It's gone. It's yeah, gone. You've so. lost it. Well, Eric, Schedule thank you part. so much. We really appreciate you joining us and dropping awesome. all that information on us. Uh, we, we appreciate you speeding that up from, from sure, yeah. two hours down to an hour. That was, that was a magnificent job. So uh, thank you for joining us. My pleasure. And thanks to Canon as always. Uh, everybody joining us today, thank you as well for joining us. We really appreciate it. Uh, be sure to come back next time and catch us for another event here at the virtual B&H event space. See All you right. soon, Eric. 
Thanks, everybody. Appreciate your time.